Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. The last time we met, we started looking at the third of the models that we used to understand how to apply the ideas of quantum mechanics to real chemical systems. The first two models were the particle in a box and the particle in a well, which we talked about in videos 7 and 8. The third model is the rigid rotor, which is a good model for diatomic molecules. As we saw last time, we have to use concepts from quantum mechanics in order to determine the energy needed to change a molecule's rotational motion. That means we'll use the Schrodinger equation, which is this. As we saw in video 10, it makes sense to use spherical coordinates when modeling a rigid rotor, not Cartesian coordinates. So we need to convert the Schrodinger equation from Cartesian coordinates to spherical ones. When we do that, here's what we get. This looks pretty horrible. It's definitely much more complicated than the equation we had in Cartesian coordinates. And it would be kind of a nightmare if we had to keep the equation in this form. But luckily, we can simplify it to a much easier expression. First, let's move the e psi term to the left side of the equation. Next, we'll get rid of the constant out front by multiplying both sides by negative 2mr squared over h bar squared. Believe it or not, what we get as a result is a much more manageable equation than the one we had a moment ago. Here's why. This equation has three variables in it, r, theta, and phi. But if you look carefully, you'll notice that the first and last terms contain only the variable r, whereas the second and third terms contain only theta and phi. But remember what r actually means in the rigid rotor model. r is the distance between the two atoms, but the reason the model is called a rigid rotor is because the bond doesn't vibrate, so r is a constant. That means the derivative of r is zero, so the first term drops out. Meanwhile, the fraction in front of psi in the last term is entirely made of constants. We can make that term look simpler by combining all those constants into one big constant called beta. Next, we can get rid of some of the fractions in the equation by multiplying everything by the square of sine theta. That gives us this expression. Now, let's look carefully at what's left. The remaining equation contains only two variables, theta and phi. And you might notice that the first and third terms contain only the variable theta, while the middle term contains only phi. That's actually the key that will allow us to solve this equation, and here's why. Way back in video 6, we talked about the general equation for a wave, and we had a wave that was a function of two variables, x and t. We were able to solve that equation by making one huge assumption. We assumed that the function describing the wave could be rewritten as the product of two simpler functions. One was the function capital X, which only contains the variable X, and the other was the function capital T, which only depends on the variable T. If you've forgotten that discussion, you might want to go back and review video 6, because the ideas we talked about back then will be important again now. Anyway, just as we saw in that earlier video, we can assume that the wave function psi, which is the expression that describes our system, can be rewritten as the product of two simpler expressions, each of which depends on only one variable, either theta or phi. We'll call those two simpler functions capital theta and capital phi. Let's put that into our equation wherever we have the wave function. And now, let's simplify this equation. In the first term, we're taking the derivative with respect to theta. But the function capital phi doesn't contain any thetas, so we can factor it out of the differential. In the same way, the derivative in the second term is taken with respect to phi, so we can factor the function capital theta out of that differential. Finally, let's divide everything by capital theta times capital phi. When we do that, here's what we get. But wait, why did we do that last step? 
Well, take a close look at the result that we got. In our final expression, the first and third terms only contain the variable theta and no phi's, and the middle term contains only phi and not theta. That means we can split this equation into two pieces, one that contains only theta and one containing only phi, and we can solve each part separately. Both parts of this equation are differential equations that have known solutions. Let's look at each part individually. First, we'll look at the part involving phi. When we solve it, we find out that the function, capital phi, turns out to be equal to this, 1 over the square root of 2 pi times e to the i m phi. In this equation, i is the imaginary number i, the square root of negative 1, and m is an integer. So m could be 0, positive or negative 1, positive and negative 2, and so on. Each of those different values for m will give a different numerical result for capital phi. So that's the equation for the function phi. Next, let's solve for the function theta. That portion of the expression is another differential that has a known solution. The solution is something rather complex, but it's a well-known function known as an associated Legendre polynomial, and it's named for the French mathematician Adrien-Marie Legendre. The important thing to know is that just as our expression for the function phi depended on an integer called m, the solution to the function theta depends on two different integers, l and m, where l can have a value of 0 or higher, and m has a value between positive and negative l. So, in other words, if l is equal to 3, m can be 0, positive or negative 1, positive or negative 2, or positive or negative 3. And the value of m here will also be the value of m we have in our equation for phi. If we plot the associated Legendre polynomial for a variety of values of l and m, here are the curves that we get. So now we have an expression for the function phi and another expression for the function theta. You might recall that we first saw these functions when we split our wave function into those two pieces. If we now recombine them into one big function, we get a function that depends on both theta and phi, but not r. Remember, the model we're working with is the rigid rotor, so r is a constant and not a variable. For that reason, the product of the functions theta and phi is often called the angular wave function because it only depends on the angles. It gets its own symbol, which is the capital letter Y, with a subscript, which is the value of L, and a superscript, that's the value of M. The expression described by the angular wave functions are also called spherical harmonics, and they pop up in many different applications in physics. Here's what some of them look like. The top row is the spherical harmonic where L is 0. The second row shows the spherical harmonics where L is equal to 1, and so on. You probably recognize that these look very similar to the shapes of atomic orbitals. They're not quite the same, though, because these functions don't include the variable r, which does make some important changes to the details of the function when we start to plot orbitals. We'll find out more about that in some future videos. Anyway, now that we have a definite expression for the wave function, we can solve the Schrodinger equation and find out the energy of a rigid rotor. When we solve the equation, it turns out to be a lengthy process, but here's what we get in the end. In this equation, I is the moment of inertia, which we talked about in the previous video j is the number of the rotational energy level, so it's an integer equal to 0 or higher. The lowest value, 0, gives the energy of the ground rotational state, and the higher values of j are for excited rotational states. So what can we do with these results? 
Well, suppose we perform an experiment in which we excite a molecule from one rotational state to another. We'll call the two rotational states JA and JB. In that case, we get these two equations. If we study this using spectroscopy, what we're actually measuring is the change in energy, which is given by this equation. Now it turns out that when the rotational energy changes, the level can only go up or down by one. We never see the rotational energy change from, say, level zero to level two. So that means if the energy level increases, JB must be equal to JA plus one. That gives us this for our equation. Let's simplify this. First, we'll factor h bar squared over 2i out of the equation. Next, we'll multiply these two terms together, and also these two terms. We can simplify the term that we now have in brackets, which is equal to 2ja plus 2. That gives us a final result of delta e equals h bar squared over i times ja plus 1. So, that's the energy change that occurs when a rigid rotor changes its energy level. Notice what this equation is telling us. The moment of inertia is in the denominator, and you might recall that this depends on the reduced mass of the molecule. So, the mass has a large effect on the energy necessary to change the rotation of the molecule. That makes sense. And as we saw in the last video, this means that we'll need to know exactly what the mass of the molecule is, so we need to be sure what isotope of each element we have. Let's use what we've learned. Suppose we have a sample of carbon monoxide in the ground rotational state. The sample is isotopically pure, so that all the carbons are carbon-12, and all the oxygens are oxygen-16. The bond length in a carbon monoxide molecule is 112.8 picometers. What wavelength of light will be needed to excite the sample to a higher rotational level? Since we're starting at the ground state, J is equal to zero, so the only other thing we need to know is the moment of inertia. To get that, we need to know the reduced mass. Here's the equation for the reduced mass, which we first saw in the previous video. M1 and M2 are 12 AMUs and 16 AMUs, which gives us a reduced mass of 6.857 AMU. We need to convert that to kilograms, which is the SI unit. When we do that, we find out that we get 1.139 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. We plug that into the equation for the moment of inertia, along with a bond length in meters. That gives us a moment of inertia of 1.449 times 10 to the minus 46 kilograms times meters squared. We can plug that into our equation for energy, which gives us 7.676 times 10 to the minus 23 joules. If we use this equation to change this to frequency, we get 1.158 times 10 to the 11 seconds to the minus one. That's a wavelength of 0.00259 meters, or 2.59 millimeters. If we look at a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum, we find out that this is the microwave region of the spectrum. That's generally true, we usually use microwave spectroscopy to study the rotational energy of molecules. Here's a picture of the rotational spectrum of carbon monoxide. The x-axis here is the frequency and wave numbers instead of the wavelength, but it turns out to exactly match what our calculation predicted. The peak where JA is zero is this one, and it's at 3.87 wave numbers, which corresponds to a wavelength of 0.00259 meters, exactly what we predicted. The other peaks are for molecules that started in a higher rotational energy level. 
As you can see, these peaks are higher than the peak for our calculation, because most of the molecules actually start in an excited rotational state instead of the ground state, so we get taller peaks. Let's try one more example. Suppose we have a sample of niobium oxide in the ground rotational state, where the sample is isotopically pure, so that all the niobium is niobium-93, and all the oxygen is oxygen-16. We take a rotational spectrum and find out that a peak occurs at 11.59 millimeters. What's the equilibrium bond length in this molecule? We'll use this equation again. This time, the unknown in our equation is the moment of inertia, so we'll solve for that. First, we need to change the wavelength to energy. When we convert to frequency, we get 2.586 times 10 to the 10 seconds to the minus 1. And converting that to energy gives us 1.713 times 10 to the minus 23 joules. Now we can solve for the moment of inertia. That gives us 6.491 times 10 to the minus 46 kilograms times meters squared. Finally, we need to find the bond length, r. To do that, we need to know the reduced mass. We'll plug in 93 AMU and 16 AMU for the masses in the reduced mass equation. That gives us a reduced mass of 13.65 AMUs. That's equal to 2.267 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. We use that in our equation for the moment of inertia, and we find that that gives us r is equal to 1.692 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, or 169.2 picometers. So that's the equilibrium bond length. Before we finish up, there's one more thing to know about rotational spectroscopy. In rotational spectroscopy, the reason we can detect the rotation is because the rotation creates a variation in the electromagnetic field around the molecule. So in order to produce a signal in our spectrometer, that means the molecule needs to have an electric dipole moment. In other words, the molecule must be polar, so the rotation of a completely nonpolar molecule can't be detected using microwave spectroscopy. That means molecules like carbon dioxide, methane, and benzene, which are all nonpolar, don't show up in a microwave spectrum. We'll talk more about the reason for that in a future video. But that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start looking at vibrations, which is what we detect using infrared spectroscopy. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.